Uh, hi everyone, welcome to the 11th IAEA webinar and our ninth panel. Uh, today's topic is uh, on Iran's manufacturing industries and international sanctions. Couldn't be more topical. Uh, I'm going to hand over straight to our chair, uh, IAEA board member and uh, professor in Ohio State University, Aida, and who will introduce the fantastic panelists that we have. And over to you. Thank you, Kamal. Hi, everyone. It is my pleasure to share this session. As you know, the session is about the impact of sanction on manufacturing in Iran. We do have four, we have three very interesting uh, presentations. Uh, I go ahead and let presenters uh, to, to, uh, to introduce themselves and go for 15 to 20 minutes to present their paper. Uh, we go ahead and start with about a body. Uh, the floor is yours. Please go ahead. Just before starting the presentation, I would like to emphasize while you may use the chat to chat with each other, we are not going to read the chat. We are going to monitor Q&A. You're muted. I think we lost Ida. I think we lost Ida for a second. Hey, but maybe you can just start. I think Ida right. had to continue. Okay. I think what Ida wanted to say is don't use, please use the chat function to chat amongst yourself. Put all the questions in the Q&A section and the speakers will try to address them either live as you're, as you're typing or um, afterwards uh, when everybody's finished. Okay, about over to you. Sure. Uh, so let me quickly introduce myself and I'm just uh, not taking too much time to introduce myself and going to present my work. So uh, I'm a PhD candidate in George Washington University. I um, uh, did my master's at the LSE and also at the University of Tehran. And I also work for the World Bank and IMF. So this is, I guess, in a nutshell, uh, this is what I want to sell, uh, what I want to tell about myself. So. Uh, and I'm very happy to present my results, uh, latest result on the impact of economic sanctions on Iranian uh, manufacturing firms. So uh, let me see. Okay. So over the past few decades, we have seen an increase in the number of economic sanctions imposed by the United States and European countries against other nations, including Afghanistan, China, Russia, Iran, Syria, and Venezuela. Uh, for example, over the past month, we have seen an unprecedented sanctions imposed on Russia after the Russian invasion of Ukraine. So the United States and European country responded to Russia's attacks by imposing restrictive sanctions on the Russian economy, which hit the country significantly. Furthermore, uh, the US and EU imposed restrictive economic sanctions against Iran over the past decades due to Iran's nuclear activity. The point of the paper is to show what these sanctions means for the firms within these targeted nation. And for doing that, I, use, I, I study the 2012 and 2013 US-led international economic sanctions against Iran. These sanctions were a combination of negative international demand and supply shock which they cut Iranian export by 48.5 billion US dollars and import by 10 billion US dollars just over a year. And these sanctions led the country to the stage of a stagflation with a negative GDP growth of 7% and an inflation rate of 35%. But we know little about the impact of these sanctions within these targeted nations. For example, how the firms in these sanctioned countries responded to these and macro sanction shocks. In order to do that, I explore Iranian manufacturing firm surveys from 2009 to 2013, which covers more than 12,000 firms in 136 industries every year. I use difference and difference regression to estimate the causal effect of economic sanctions. And I show that the sanction had the direct, indirect, and heterogeneous effects uh, on the targeted firms. 
Also, at the end, I develop a stylized model featuring heterogeneous firms with capacity constraints to quantify the aggregate effect of these economic sanctions and also to estimate the impact of the sanctions on consumer welfare. The findings of the paper are as followed. So regarding the direct effects, the sanctions cut firms export in half, drop imports by more than 30%, and significantly reduce firms' profit, revenue, and productivity. One of the interesting findings of the paper is uh, the heterogeneous effects of the sanction, which shows that the exporting and importing firm could mitigate the negative impact of the sanctions. So when exporting firms were sanctioned and they could not sell their products in the foreign market, they increased their presence in the domestic market at the expense of non-exporters. At the same time, when importing firms could not buy their intermediate inputs, uh, from the foreign markets, they uh, instead they bought more uh, from the domestic inputs, which increased the price of those inputs. So, in a sense, they diverted the sanction shocks to the non-importers in the market. Regarding the indirect effect, I use input-output linkages to show the propagation of the sanction shocks in the market. And I showed that the sanction transferred to non-targeted uh, in the to firms in non-targeted industries through these input-output linkages. Using the theoretical model of the paper, I estimate the impact of the sanction on consumer welfare, and I show that through the import channels, by increasing the prices, the consumer welfare would decrease. However, through export channels the consumer welfare will increase because the prices will decrease. And it relates to the heterogeneous effects that I talked before, which was that exporting firms, when they were sanctioned, they sold their products more in the domestic markets. So more, more supply will decrease the prices and it will increase the consumer welfare. However, however it is important to note that these findings are for a given level of income, which means that in the theoretical model, I shut down the income channel. Uh, so my paper relates to economic sanction literature, which most of the studies are here in the literature use the country level data, which make it difficult to estimate the causal effect of economic sanctions, since it's challenging to disentangle the sanction shocks from other macroeconomic shocks. Uh, but we see that there were ample studies using the firm level data and the contribution of my paper uh, to this literature is that it covers more industries and large set of firms. So it shows uh, better the heterogeneous effects that the sanctions had uh, within the, on the firms within the targeted nations. Also the paper relates to the international trade literature by showing that when the firms were sanctioned and they could not purchase their intermediate inputs from abroad, the productivity would decrease. So it relates to the studies that shows the positive relationship between the imported intermediate inputs and firm level productivity. The outline of the presentation would be as follows. First, I'm going to talk about the empirical approach, data, background of the sanctions that I'm studying in this paper. After that, I'm going to show you the direct heterogeneous effects. And uh, for the interest of time, I'm skipping the part of the indirect effects. And I uh, suggest the interested readers to, in, to read the paper. And regarding the theoretical framework, though I'm not going to show the theoretical model in the presentation, but I'm going to show the results and prediction that uh, comes from the model. Okay, so the sanction that I'm studying in this paper is the economic sanction and in, in specifically the trade sanctions that imposed on Iran due to Iran's nuclear activity. The economic sanctions that were related to the Iran's nuclear activity were imposed on the country in, first in 2006 when the UN Security Council imposed 
some uh, sanctions that were particularly targeted the Iranian nuclear activity. And these sanctions, they didn't have impact on other economic sector of the country, or in other sense, they didn't impact the Iranian economy significantly. However, after the talk between Iran and European countries collapsed in to late 2011, the US and EU started to impose restrictive sanctions and also industry-specific sanctions, which they target the energy sector of the Iran. Uh, and I'm going to talk about this more in the next slide. After that, in 2012, EU bans uh, EU imposed bans on Iranian oil and petrochemical exports. The US and EU targeted the Iranian financial institution, including the central bank of the country. The US imposed secondary sanctions on Iran, which isolated the country even more. In November 2013, Iran reached a preliminary deal known as JPOA, which paved the way for the later day deal, which is known as JCPOA or Iran nuclear deal. The sanctions that I'm studying in this paper are the, the restrictive sanctions imposed in 2012 and 2013, which they had um, the most of the economic uh, impact on the Iranian economy. And as I said, the sanction before, they didn't impact the uh, different economic sector of the country uh, significantly. So I'm comparing the years between the 2009 to 2013. Uh, this as I said, this is the data. So we have the unbalanced panel, uh, which covers more than 12,000 firms in 136 industries. I deflated the value using the appropriate price indices and using the reports to the US Congress and the sanction entities that is published by OFAC. I mapped the sanction industries from those reports to the data set and I identify 1178 targeted firms in 11 industries, which they were located in three main economic sectors, which are energy, automobile, automotive or vehicle, shipbuilding and aircraft, which also uh, referred to them as a transportation industry. Also, I use the 2011 input output table, which predates the sanction shocks in order to trace upstream and downstream demand linkages to show the propagation of the sanction shock in the market. Now, to give you a view of how important these sanction firms were across the manufacturing firms, we see that they were contributed to the 67% of the total revenue and 76% of the total export of Iranian manufacturing industries. However, when excluding the energy firms, we see that these shares would drop significantly. So for example, the export share would drop from 76% to only 6%. At the same time, we see that the share of the employment and import of these sanctioned industries across manufacturing firms would not change much when excluding the energy sector. So the takeaway from this graph is that the energy firms impacted mostly through the export channels, though the other, sec uh, the other sanctioned industry, which are the transportation and automotive industry, they were impacted mostly through the import channels. Now, the specification that I'm going to use in order to estimate the causal effect of the sanction is this, which I use the firm and year fixed effects. Also, I the SJT is the variable of interest, which is one for firms in sanction industry J in 2012 and 2013, and it's going to be zero otherwise. In order to study the heterogeneous effects of the sanctions and seeing the mechanism that the sanctions would impact the firms, I introduced the variables export I and import I in the model, which they are the time invariant variable. So for example, the export I shows that whether the firm is a non-exporting firm or it's an exporting firm with a share below the median, or it is an exporting firm with a share above the median. 
and it goes the same for the importing firms as well. Now, the first set of results shows that the sanctions significantly impacted the export and import values. The baseline results here are the last two columns, which here in this table, I use different specification in order to estimate the impact of the economic sanctions on export and import values. And in the paper, I discuss why the last two columns are the baseline results. So uh, we see that the baseline results here shows that the sanctions drop firms export uh, by 47% and drop import by 37%. Furthermore, the sanctions significantly impacted firms' profit, revenue, purchase of domestic inputs, and employment. And we see that when excluding the energy firms, the results are statistically, highly statistically significant, and also they are large in magnitude. So for example, the coefficient here for the profit shows that the uh, shows that the sanction reduce firms profit by about 30 percent so quickly show you the event study plots here we see that clearly that the sanction had impact on the employment which is here in 2012 and 2013 and we see no pretrends here so also we see that the uh, there were the sanction, the non sanction industry were not different in terms of the uh, changes in employment in the years before. Moving forward, the heterogeneous effects of the sanctions shows that the firms with high export shares, which I want to call them the high exporters, adjust to these sanction shocks much better compared to non exporters. And not only that, they increase their total revenue in the aftermath of the sanctions, uh, which we can see it in the column two. But seeing at the column three, we see that this is because of the uh, significant increase in their domestic revenue in the aftermath of the sanction. So what this result suggests is that after the sanctions, the exporting firms uh, diverted to domestic market, they increased their presence in the domestic market to sell their product there. And we see that for the domestic revenue, the result holds when excluding the energy firms. And we see that going back to the graph that I showed show you before, the energy firms impacted mostly through the export channel, as we can see here that the results are mainly significant in the panel A, which includes all the firms. But when seeing the importing firms and seeing the import channel, we see that excluding the energy firms, the results are sig mostly significant for the firms that they are not in the energy firm, for the sanctioned firms that they are not in the energy sector. So here we see again that the high importers, they could adjust better to the sanction shocks compared to non-importers in the market. However, the total revenue for these firms uh, dropped unlike the high exporters, which suggests that there were some intermediate inputs that they're important in the production. And as a result of the sanctions, the total production would drop for these firms. Also, I showed the impact of the sanctions on firm level productivity using two estimates for the total factor productivity, which are OP and LP, which uh, with the ACF correction. So we see that using different estimates and different specification, we have all the results are significant, showing that the sanctions significantly reduce firm level productivity. And seeing the mechanism for it, we see that this is happened through the import channel. As we can see that the high importers, the firms with the high import shares, they, uh, they had more negative, they experienced a more negative impact on their productivity uh, through this channel. To sum up the empirical results, economic sanctions had significant and direct effects on firms' export, import, profit, revenue, and demand for inputs. 
exporting and importing firms could mitigate the adverse effect of sanctions by diverting to the domestic market and economic sanction drop firm level productivity through import channel. Also, economic sanctions propagated in the market and had statistically indirect effects on targeted and non-targeted firms, mainly on the firms in the downstream industries, and but due for the interest of time, I'm not going to talk about it in the presentation uh, at the moment. Now, quickly talking about the theoretical framework. In the theoretical model, I showed that the import sanction decreased importing firms' revenue by reducing productivity. So this is the channel that I discussed in the theoretical model that why the sanction decreased the firm's revenue through the import channels, through the export channels, the sanction reduced firms' export and increased exporting firms' domestic sale in the presence of capacity constraint. So here, uh, in these, the proposition one and two, support the empirical finding uh, of the paper. And the proposition three shows that the import sanction reduced agri-consumer welfare, whereas export sanctions increase agri-consumer welfare in the presence of capacity constraint. So to give you why this is, to give you an idea why this is the case, when the importing firms were sanctioned and the firm could not buy its product uh, from abroad. So as we show in the in pre part, the production will decrease the, though they could mitigate the impact of the sanction, but the total production will decrease, the supply will be less. So the price will increase and it will reduce consumer welfare by 7.5%. However, the export channel or the channel or the sanction that impact the firms through the exporting channel, since the exporting firms are going to sell more domestically after the sanction when they cannot sell their products in the foreign market, the supply in the domestic market will increase, the prices will go down, and it will increase the consumer welfare by 4.35%. Again, please do remember that these results are for a given level of income. So I'm not discussing here the uh, impacts on the consumer welfare through the income level, which means that um, the lower employment that we have. And also one other important thing to note about the results of the paper is that it shows the lower bound impact of the sanctions because I'm studying the trade sanctions and industry specific sanctions, though we had the financial sanction as well during the same time. So let me stop here and I'll be happy to discuss uh, the results further in the Q&A session. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much for the presentation. We move to next one. Uh, Bijan, are you ready to share your screen? Yes, I'm ready. Yes, thank I will share the screen. Hi, everyone. It's a great pleasure to be here. Thank you uh, to the organizers. I also have a short presentation. Uh, let me see. Okay. Um, so just short introduction. Bijan Khajapur is my name. I'm a strategy consultant based in Vienna, Austria, and uh, I've been studying the Iranian economy for the past 30 years. Uh, so um, it's um, sometimes it's actually good to reflect uh, and go back and look at some of these phases like Ebot has done about the, the first wave of large sanctions. Um, but, and, and it's clear, I mean, from Ebot's presentation and also from other indicators in Iran that sanctions have had a number of negative consequences. But when we look forward uh, at the next decade uh, in the Iranian economy, uh, what we can say is that Iran desperately needs uh, what I would call smart investment, smart investment that it can actually target those topics like uh, about mentioned productivity and, and other issues that can create an economic uh, momentum in Iran. We also know that as long as these sanctions exist, it will be very difficult to attract foreign investment as smart investment into the country. So the smart approach would be to try to separate the two elements of smart investment, meaning the capital 
and we know for a fact that there is enough capital in the Iranian economy, and then the innovative part, the technology part. And what I want, want to do here um, is just to look at the, the innovative side, the technology side. Uh, what I will refer a lot to knowledge-based companies and, and try to gauge uh, how sanctions and external pressure have changed the nature of Iranian knowledge-based companies and how they have responded um, to the needs of the industry. Because as we heard from Ebot, uh, it's clear that the reaction of, of a company that is under pressure because of external sanctions, it starts looking at, at domestic resources, at domestic companies as suppliers or, or partners and so on. And let's, let's uh, look at some industries and try to come to some sort of a conclusion. First of all, facts and figures. This is actually very interesting. This, this decree by the Iranian government is exactly from the time that Ebot was describing, from the time when there was a lot of pressure on Iranian companies and uh, the government came out with this uh, notion of uh, companies should be improving efficiency of production systems, offering incentives to uh, leading producers, expanding research, et cetera, et cetera. You can read it yourself. But the fact is that there was, a, there was actually a, a, an agenda of, of creating greater linkages between domestic companies. We can always analyze and see how it went wrong in that phase, but I, I'm, I, I want to say it's actually happening now. It's happening after the introduction of the maximum pressure sanctions over the past four years, and that there is a lot more cooperation between Iranian industry Iranian universities and the byproducts of Iranian universities, whether it's startups or so-called knowledge-based um, uh, companies. Um, you, I'm sure those of you looking at the Iranian industry have noticed the increase in uh, reference to knowledge-based uh, companies. In fact, those of you who studied the so-called 20-year vision document in 2005 will realize that in 2005, Iran had a vision of becoming a knowledge-based economy by 2025. So some of that urgency to become knowledge-based or, or have more knowledge-based uh, companies uh, has also come from the sanctions. It's very important. And by coincidence, you know, the Iranian Supreme Leader, Ayatollah uh, Khamenei, he always gives a slogan to every year. And this year's slogan is knowledge-based and job-creating production. So there is a lot of emphasis, at least in word, but also indeed to, to a concept of knowledge-based. And if you look at the figures, Iran right now has 49 science and technology parks. If you go back 20 years, these didn't exist in Iran. It's really something more recent. It has 224 accelerators, also known as growth centers, Markeze Rosht, which are usually connected to uh, leading universities. 1,700 knowledge-based companies and 10,500 technology companies. So there is a lot more happening in Iran in terms of developing technologies and, and solutions that the country's industry needs. Um, it's important for us to also understand the, the, the changing linkages. I think those of you who have looked at Iran, studied Iran, know that Iranian enterprises have historically always entered into licensing agreements with foreign, mainly European companies. Um, so there was no genuine uh, research and development in an in Iranian in enterprise. All they had to do was find a partner that was prepared to sell them a technology license. I mean, look at the automotive industry's history. It was always, you know, getting, getting licenses from, from foreign companies and just um, basically, uh, paying a license fee and producing. Um, a number of factors, if you look at the past two, three decades, a number of factors, especially demography, also there's more efficient higher education and also increasing attention to domestic companies, both as a result of government policy, but also as a result of sanctions have created some space for knowledge-based companies. And, and we will see some of them in this presentation. But the, the fact is, and I've looked at these and I've, I've been involved in a number of these company developments, 
uh, the initial approach of knowledge-based companies in Iran was also to imitate Western products and solutions. It was not about uh, you know, investing into research and developing their own product. It was just, let's just check what's happening outside and just imitate it, create an Iranian version and offer it. But the fact is that a lot of these solutions were not really uh, uh, appropriate for the market. So sanctions have both cut these relationships also in the IT sector and in the technology sector, but also uh, pushed uh, domestic knowledge-based companies to produce more and more the needs of the Iranian industry, uh, which were communicated sort of the, the ecosystem in, involves these larger enterprises, whether importing or exporting, uh, universities who were always the intermediaries of sort of communicating these needs and the knowledge-based companies or startups. So, um, so you can, as a result, we know that the, the basically this category of knowledge-based companies are, have been on the rise. So what are the challenges these companies are facing? And this, I can tell you uh, from a lot of, a number of interviews, direct interviews with them. There is genuinely a lack of funding. I mean, this, you can say, this is the challenge of the entire Iranian industry. Uh, even though the government you know, has a number of decrees to support domestic companies, to support knowledge-based companies, but uh, as we all know, the banking sector is not that efficient in, in these matters. There is also a lot of concern about um, patenting technologies and, and you know, innovations in Iran. It's a sad fact that only 4% of Iranian innovations are actually patented in Iran. Um, most of the you know, entrepreneurs or, or professors or, or innovators who innovate something, usually also something very good, they try to patent it outside Iran because they are afraid of losing that um, intellectual property to other uh, forces in Iran. The result is that a lot of ideas actually go to waste and, and that is a sad one. This is actually a plea also to all of us to help Iranian innovators so that their ideas don't go to waste. There, are, there is also obviously a, a lack of access to some basic services, despite the growth of these accelerators and, and university programs to support uh, these, uh, these innovations. Uh, banking, I mentioned, their need for scientific resources. In a lot of cases, the scientific resources are outside Iran and, and access to them is also hampered by, by sanctions, uh, laboratory facilities, other infrastructure, there is, a, there is a long list of uh, problems. And obviously, like any other econo economic activity in Iran, there, is, there are political and economic uncertainties as well as the regulatory issues. And I can tell you that a lot, some of these knowledge-based companies also suffer from the fact that they are just a new phenomenon. So the, the authorities, whether it's the tax office or, or the labor of, uh, office, they don't understand the needs of, of these um, companies and that means that they are they are faced uh, with a lot of um, issues. Then there there is also a mismatch between what the country actually needs, what the economy needs, and and what is actually being done in terms of development of new solutions, new products. Partly you can explain that because a lot of these uh, young entrepreneurs or startups uh, they they develop ideas partly with a with an you know, idea of migrating at some point. So they look at products that they can develop that they may be also able to sell or develop outside Iran. Just one example, uh, as you know, the agriculture sector is depending on the year, something between 12 or 13% of the Iranian economy. And it's an important sector for startup activity and knowledge-based activity because of the water situation and, and all the other challenges, but only 6% of the knowledge-based uh, companies and startups relate to the agricultural sector. You can see the mismatch, again, partly explained by the desire for migration, which is a, another sad factor in Iran. So let's look at some sectors. Uh, obviously, this will be very brief, and I will just touch the, the you know, upper layer of each of these sectors, but I think it's interesting to look at what's happening. Obviously, the most important, we saw that in Ebot's uh, presentation as well. Oil and gas upstream is an important sector in Iran and has been has been um, hit by the sanctions 
it has hit the sanctions have hit their production capacity, the ability to invest, the ability to export access to technologies. But fact is that the Iranian uh, Ministry of Petroleum and, and the various companies that are mostly directly or indirectly connected to the government, uh, they used this opportunity of engaging universities and, and, and basically passing on their, their research needs to the universities and then through the universities has gone to a number of uh, startup activities. And, and I can tell you some of these things I've seen from a very close range. I can tell you that um, it, these startups and these ideas, these innovations have kept the Iranian oil and gas industry, especially the gas industry, going despite the sanctions and despite all these problems. There have been very good successes in terms of sensing devices, which is very important in, in the oil and gas sector, catalysts. Uh, in fact, for a while, some of the operations in Iran were stopped because we could not get, or Iran could not get the, the catalyst, the very special catalyst they needed for specific production. Well logging equipment, uh, also a lot of new inventions in, in medium tech equipment. So you realize we still don't have the capacity to produce the high tech uh, equipment and high tech sensing devices, etc. But the medium tech, uh, is there. I always use the, the car analogy. I say we, we have the capacity to produce uh, cars on par with Peugeot and, and Renault, but we can't still produce the BMWs and the Mercedes-Benzes. That applies to all the sectors I'm going to discuss. But the, where Iran is in terms of technological development is, is certainly a, a consequence of this external pressure and of these sanctions and we can see it in different sectors. Petrochemicals is very similar, both in terms of how it has been hit, but also in terms of how uh, domestic um, innovations and domestic um, resources have tried to address the issues. Also here, um, a number of catalysts. I, I, as I said, I was involved in a couple of uh, projects where um, catalysts that uh, had stopped uh, produ petrochemical production in a number of sites were then produced domestically. And, and these are, these are uh, successes that really uh, have happened because the need was there, because the urgency was there. Because you know, if we don't have the urgency in Iran, we'll just always look for the easier solution of importing the technology, at best just getting a license from a foreign company. Automotive, very similar. It was hit hard, especially with some of the more valuable components of the cars. But if you, if you also look at the production figures, you can say it's not the uh, top quality of components. As I said, it's not the BMW or Mercedes quality, but there is, there is a growing tendency of, of uh, domestic production of these parts. Also banking sector, very interesting. Um, uh, I can tell you, for example, at, uh, especially the, the first wave of uh, sanctions that also Ebot discussed, but also later, it meant that a lot of the uh, software solutions that international banks use were not available to Iranian banks. So they all had to be developed domestically. Some of them, the banks developed themselves, but other add-on services uh, and modules were added and developed by, by startups. And, and you will see in a min minute that actually this is the one of the highest activities in terms of startup activity in the sectors, in the, in the payment, especially payment sector. Some other things, ag agricultural food, I mentioned the mismatch. So we, we definitely need a lot more activity in the agriculture sector, but it's very interesting how the domestic companies and domestic uh, startups and knowledge-based companies have, have developed solutions that actually fit the Iranian uh, situation, both water situation, climatic situation, also food culture. So um, as you see a lot of uh, greenhouses, I, I'm personally amazed when I look at some of the greenhouse projects in Iran that produce the type of pr products that uh, the Iranian families want. Uh, in a very efficient way, both in terms of water consumption, but also in terms of productivity. And a lot of them are the result of local research and local um, developments and, and solutions. Um, pharma industry, even though agriculture, food and pharma are theoretically not sanctioned, 
we all know that uh, there has been limited access to uh, raw materials, to solutions and, and equipment, etc. And also in the pharma sector, we have seen a lot of very interesting developments, including more complex developments in, in nanotechnology, developing the nanotechnological par uh, particles that pharma companies need in their production and in, in uh, equipment. So it's very, very interesting that uh, we can record all of these innovations and, and um, developments, as I said, in a manner that really responds to the needs in the Iranian uh, industry. Um, water, wastewater is also one of those sectors where we desperately need um, innovations and, and, and also especially in the irrigation because Iran does not have the water resources for the type of agricultural activity that it has had in the past. So agricultural activity has to be adjusted. Part of the adjustment is also using new irrigation technologies that are being developed by these knowledge-based companies. And telecom is also one of those areas uh, where a lot of activity can be recorded in terms of startups, in terms of IP security development in the country. Uh, and, and I can tell you some of these um, solutions that are being developed in Iran can easily go to other markets and, and be, you know, be marketed and monetized. Um, so just as a, as a measure of achievement of these companies, I looked at how many knowledge-based companies, true knowledge-based, because you also have some governmental companies that have called themselves knowledge-based because they want to get certain grants from the government and so on. But these, the, the companies that I counted, I, I look, looked at 25 knowledge-based companies that have been accepted on the so-called Faro Bourse. Faro Bourse is the site capital market in Tehran. So it's not the Tehran Stock Exchange itself, but it's actually the side market where the entry is a bit easier than being listed on the Tehran Stock Exchange. But even getting listed there is, is, a, is a major process. And out of these 25 companies, six of them are in the automotive sector and heavy machinery, five are in payment solutions, five are in pharmaceuticals, four in chemicals and petrochemicals and three in metals, mining industry, and two in agriculture. So it shows you, first of all, the capital market is, uh, is, is sort of um, absorbing these knowledge-based uh, companies, but also developing um, formulas to, to finance them, which, as I said, was one of the first challenges. So we will, I think we will see a lot more from these knowledge-based companies over the next decade, especially as they develop more and more solutions not, not, not only for the Iranian uh, industry, but maybe with a look to at least exporting to the region. Um, so it, they are becoming uh, an important phenomenon and gradually also accepted by the, by the market. Let me conclude. Um, so we all know, I mean, we have seen it in different presentations, different analyses that despite sanctions, the Iranian economy has remained relatively resilient and vibrant and, and has tried to address the, the shortcomings through domestic capacities, sometimes with success, sometimes with uh, limitations, but it's important to, to recognize that it's happening. The shift of various companies away from just imitating foreign solutions towards trying to develop local, local um, uh, products and solutions through own research or through cooperation with knowledge-based companies is an important, important fact in the Iranian economy. And I can tell you, uh, without sanctions, it would have not happened this quickly. Uh, Ebad mentioned the word product productivity a number of times. Obviously, sanctions uh, and external pressure have, have had an impact on productivity and efficiency in the Iranian economy. But we all know that there were also other sources of lack of productivity and efficiency. And this is the main thing. When we try to understand uh, the logic behind some of these uh, domestic developments, that there is always a focus on increasing efficiency. And, and in fact, increasing efficiency can be a very important source of economic growth, GDP growth in Iran. And, and it's good to see that some companies are, are looking at it as, as a main source of uh, increased activity. The bad news is that the state bureaucracy as a whole is not really geared for, for what's happening in Iran. So these companies uh, are put under pressure, apart from the 
intellectual property aspect that I mentioned. There, there are other barriers that, that, that need to be addressed. I hope that the, 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 the state as a whole tries to understand the, the needs of these companies, which are usually small, but very sensitive and very important. Uh, and, and obviously political, economic and regulatory risks have to be addressed. There are, and I can tell you, we have witnessed a couple of them. There are an increasing number of these Iranian solutions that can actually go regional and even international. But again, here you need infrastructure, you need certain capacities. So it's not just uh, what they have, these knowledge-based companies have contributed to domestic industry. They can theoretically over next, next decade add to Iran's export potential. And obviously the, the reduced dependency on importation and uh, components is going to potentially increase um, the export potential, anymore. not just because of these knowledge-based companies, but because they obviously are in a much better position um, to expand their production. I'm going to stop here. Thank you for your attention and I look forward to your comments and questions. Thank you, Bijan, for the presentation. Uh, we have one more presentation, the last but not the least. We let Hadi to talk, please. Hello everyone and welcome for joining this session and thanks to IAEA for organizing the this, this session. I'm Hadi Saleh Esfahani and I've been with the University of Illinois at Urbana Champaign, recently decided to retire and move to Northern California. Okay, so let me share my screen here and tell you what this research is all about. This is research in the making, and therefore there may be some rough edges. Any comments and suggestions would be very much appreciated. The topic, this is joint work with Dr. Korsar Yusufi at Tehran University, and we look at the patterns of change in Iran's manufacturing during a period of intensified international sanctions, which is 2012-2013. This the, the data set that we use is the same as Abad has used, and what he discussed is very relevant to what we do. Also, the, the presentation by Bijan was very relevant, and I'm going to come back to the comments he made and also the implications of what he has found for the results that we get and also for the future of industrial development in Iran. Now, let me start by just reminding everyone that GDP growth slowed down during sanctions period. The GDP figure inclusive of oil and energy sector dropped, but if you look at non-oil GDP, it was relatively flat during intensification of sanctions. And what is interesting is that if you look at manufacturing output, it dropped quite considerably during intensified periods of intensified sanctions, at least initially, and then rebounded. And this observation is important. And also it's important to understand how much production can rebound and continue to grow in the future, even if sanctions continue. I'm gonna come back to this later on when I present the results. Now, measuring the effects of sanctions on firms is very difficult because there are so many factors involved. For example, let's start with restrictions on access to imported imp consumer goods, intermediate goods, capital goods, and also access to limited limits in access to technology, access to global banking and finance, access to export markets, which are all the factors that Abad had taken into account in his paper. But then the, 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 there's the issue of import substitution that could actually help some industries and some firms as foreign competition declines. At the same time, intensification of sanctions 
changes the exchange rate, changes inflation rate. And in the case of Iran, in 2012-2013, there was a major jump in inflation, major jump in exchange rate, relative wages went down, relative prices changed, and those things also affected every firm, all, all, all the firms. So one can think about that as indirect effects of sanctions. And banking restrictions affected all the firms, so separating out individual sectors or industries or firms that have been affected by sanctions more than others, it becomes very difficult. On top of this, government response was also involved and sorting out what effect that had on the, on the firms is a story in itself. And finally, something that I'm gonna discuss briefly but very importantly, there were shifts in the way people saved and invested, and investment was partly driven by considerations of hedging against inflation and instability, for example, by investing more in real estate compared to machinery, and that those kinds of factors also come in. So the sorting out how all these factors, all these elements play the role in reducing production of manufacturing firms during intensified periods of sanctions becomes very difficult. So that's the difficulty. That's not an easy task, but uh, in, in a somewhat different approach than Abbott had taken, we tried to look at the situation from a different angle. The past, and that might provide a way of gaining some insight about what happened under intensified sanctions and what accounts for the decline in output. What we can do and what we do in this paper is that we estimate a model of firm behavior before changes in sanctions and then look at the deviation from the model during years of sanctions and we ask the question, how did the pattern of firm activity shift be before and after intensified sanctions? This helps us gain some insight. Once the results come out, we can see that it gives us some idea how the sanction, intensified sanctions and the associated factors, everything else that was going on, may have affected the firms and also how did the firm respond and what did do to production, investment, productivity, et cetera. So le let me introduce the basic model that we develop and estimate. Uh, uh, unlike Ebad's paper where individual variables, individual measures of performance are, uh, are explained by whether the, the firm or the industry was sanctioned or not. Here, what we do is we look at how various measures of performance of firm, for example, output, relates to the existing assets, to existing characteristics of the firm, and how did it behave before sanctions and after sanctions were intensified. So let us take the case of output of the firm and see how the model looks like. So QIJT is the out log of output of firm I in industry J at time T. And it's determined by relative prices that it faces, the firm faces, and existing characteristics of the firm. In particular, it's total factor productivity and capital stock at the beginning of each year. And here we identify two types of capital, machinery and real estate, because of the, the way they respond differently to the incentives and to instability in the economy. And we also take account of other relevant measures or characteristics of the firm that are measurable. Import dependence, export orientation, 
energy intensity and inventory or working capital needs. So there may there are other characteristics that may be important, but we actually take account of these measure these characteristics that we can measure relatively easily, and that may give us an idea how the firms responded and how the effect was heterogeneous the impact of sanctions on firms were heterogeneous based on these characteristics. Now, to estimate the model, we specified in an error correction form. So the growth rate of output is related to an error correction term where the long-term relationship between output, productivity, capital stock, here I just use K for one type of capital stock, but in the actual estimation, we use both types, machinery and real estate. P is relative prices. And X uh, QIJT is the set of variables that characteristics like export orientation, import dependence, et cetera, that I mentioned. So that's the set of variables. Uh, characteristics of the firm that we take into account in the estimation. And then there are a set of short-term deviations, which is which could be added to it, that may explain the short-term growth rate of the firm. Now, here we take into account or, or include a time dummy, which, is, as we're going to see, plays a key, an important role in assessing what happens. Also, we have industry fixed effects. And what, what we do is that we estimate this for the period between 2007 and 2013. And we look at the time effects for 2012 and 2013 to see whether the output growth deviated from the model that we that depend that we estimated giving for the entire period so if for example tau q for 2012 is positive it means that in addition, or negative, for example, it says that in addition to the factors, the way the factors that determined output worked, there was some additional factor due to sanctions. Otherwise, it, tau is, for example, for 2012 and 2013 are zero. What it tells us is that any drop in output must be due to changes in other factors like productivity or capital stock or prices or other other characteristics of the firm. So that's how we figure out whether sanctions directly affected the variable or affected something like output indirectly through other variables. The, the the short-term changes in capital stock, DKIJT, affect production with one period delay. So we use the lag va values for, for that variable here. So that's the lag value. But we, we assume that productivity changes and price changes could simultaneously and currently affect production. And we maintain the same set of assumptions for labor and for investment. The current productivity shifts and price changes affect production, investment, employment, but the changes in investment come with a one period lag. So now, we extend the model a little bit because it's possible that the way characteristics of the firm influence output may change during periods of intensified sanctions so, or, or whatever other factor that may have been playing a role in the economy. So for example, we add an interaction term between the XQIJT minus one that we had 
that was the set of variables that like export orientation, import orientation, etc. that we, we had in the model. And we interacted with it, the time dummy for the two periods where sanctions were intensified, 2012 and 2013. And those thetas basically tell us whether there was additional factors, additional effects due to sanctions that made export orientation or import dependence more significant or not. Or for example, energy intensity or dependence on working capital. How, how, those, how did those characteristics change the way they influence output if, if these thetas are different from zero? So similar interactive terms can be added for other factors included in the model, but they're generally insignificant. And also it becomes impossible to estimate because we have so many parameters and that complicates the matter. So we just focus on is the interactions between the four characteristics that I mentioned, trade dependence, export orientation, import dependence, energy intensity and working capital dependence. So because time is short, I'm gonna first go over the main results and give you a, a hint about what is the insight, the key insight that this research provides so far. And then uh, I'm gonna, if I, there's more time, I'm gonna show some of the estimates and, and the re results that, and how we infer results from the estimates. Now, most manufacturing firms experienced major drop in their output. And ne this negative impact seems to be largely due to changes in total factor productivity. Those cows that I mentioned are negative in 2013 for significantly negative for total factor productivity, but not for production, not for employment, not for investment in machinery. The drop in total factor productivity can help explain the bulk of changes in employment, investment, and exports. So that's how we conclude that total factor productivity was the channel through which firms experienced a decline in output. Now, of course, they were facing problems in the markets, imported markets, export markets, capital markets, in terms of borrowing, financing, working capital, et cetera. But it seems that as sanctions in intensified, firms tried to reorient their input and output transactions, buy from somewhere else, sell to somebody else. And this, they also may have changed in their internal processes. They adapted to the economy's new circumstances, but that came at a huge cost in terms of reduced total factor productivity, at least in the short run. Now, Bijan's presentation pointed out, made a very significant point that this may have been just a short term and the firms may have responded and may continue to respond to the new circumstances and become more innovative. In fact, our results show that total factor productivity is rather resilient. When a shock like this comes, it goes down, but then after a while, after a couple of years, even maybe sooner, you see some bounce back. So the only variable that behaved differently during those sanction years was in investment in real estate. And it actually increased during 2012, 2013. In, it seems that Inflation hedge was a major consideration for firms and they used their capital and their, the money that they could access to invest in real estate in those years. Interestingly, in, real estate does not seem to be contributing to production directly in the estimation of production function, 
of, of the of production how firms decide how much to produce and what determines the growth of output for firms real estate investment does not play much of a role and it may we do find that real estate investment has some contribution, makes some contribution to investment in machinery, which could be because it either facilitates or encourages investment in machinery. And then machinery are productive, have a key role in determining production, employment, and also they seem to be positively related to productivity growth. As some other studies also show, machinery are much more conducive to productivity growth than real estate. Trade characteristics of firms, export orientation, import dependence, do not seem to have played much of a role beyond their existing functions. So, so whatever they did before the intensification, they continue to do after the intensification. So this was not, there's no clear evidence that firms that were particularly import dependent or export oriented suffered more as a result of the sanctions shock. Energy intensity helped, seems to have helped production in 2013 for firms generally, which makes sense in Iran, energy is highly subsidized and as inflation took off in 2013, and energy prices were kept constant. Firms that were energy in intensive benefited relative to others. So that may have helped them. But energy intensity in, in discouraged real estate investment in 2013, 2014, 12 and 13. And I'm not sure exactly why that was the case. It, 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 these are, so the only variable that the only characteristic that seems to have to affect in investment in the ways different that differ from the model the the way the economy operated before intensified sanctions is a neg a negative effect an added negative effect of energy intensity or Actually, I should modify this. Energy intensity seems to help production and investment by firms. So when sanctions came, it, that effect went down. So that's the better way of explaining it. Inventory and working capital needs also had negative effect on investment and exports in 2012, but not in 2013. Okay, so last page of main results or overview of the results. Due to sharp drop in real wages, employment did not decline. So we, at the same time that we're looking at the impact of sanctions to productivity, to capital, for capital formation, et cetera, we also have real wages in the, in the employment model and real wage decline played a key role in maintaining employment, despite the fact that output went down. Manufacturing, generally, as I mentioned before, and bounced back quickly. All those error correction terms have very significant coefficients and relatively large coefficients. So the beta that we had, how growth responds to deviation from long-term Grow long term output relationship, it, they seem to strongly affect growth rate during the current period. And therefore, it, if the output goes down or total factor productivity goes down, it bounces back relatively quickly. That's what the results indicate. So, adjustment speeds are generally quite high, and price movements can also help help the economy recover rather quickly. Long-term price, price elasticities for output exports and investment tend to be quite high in the order of about 2% in case of exports somewhat higher. And therefore that says that as prices adjust, as 
the economy adjusts to the shock, it should be able to recover. And that ties very well with the observations that Bijan had about the firms dealing with the problems that they face and eventually becoming innovative and growing uh, robustly again. So because I've talked a lot and I, I don't want to get into going over time too much. So I'm going to stop here and just show, showing you how the results look like this one page. So for example, this is estimation of production. So we have an uh, error correction term. Yes. So minus 0.28 is the beta, minus beta of the equation for production. And, and then we have productivity that affects production and machinery also that has long-term effect, positive long-term effect, but we don't see much long-term effect from real estate, for example. And similarly for labor. So if, if there's there are questions and you're interested in, in seeing the results after this, I'm gonna, if you have asked questions, I'm gonna discuss it and show you more. But for now, let me just say, uh, Thank you very much for listening, and I'm ready for your questions and comments. Thank you very much. Uh, we move to questions and answers. Uh, if you raise your hand, uh, I will promote you as panelists, so you can put your video on and ask your questions. And then I am going to change your designation as panelists to attend this, to listen to the answer. Uh, just please go ahead. I do have some questions on Q&A, but I don't see any raised hands yet. Okay, no questions, no discussion. Yeah, I wanna, since I, okay, I see. So I don't comment, I stay outside. Okay, I stay as a moderator. Let me, we have Nader Habibi. Okay. Okay. Nader, could you unmute yourself and ask questions or, yes, please. Yes. Thank you very much. Um, hello, Hadi. Hello, Hi. Um, good to see all of you and thank you for presentation. My question is, um, uh, Hadi, whether there was any way for you to uh, st study the impact of the ownership on performance of manufacturing firms in the terms that um, state-owned enterprises might enjoy specific rents or supports. Uh, for example, if they are affiliated with the uh, Revolutionary Guards that independent manufacturers do not have access to. Uh, whether there was any way of observing the impact of this factor and if yes, what was the impact? Thank you. Yeah. Thanks for your good question. There is a way to some extent, I must say, because we we can't quite identify firms. We, do, we don't know the firms, names of the firms or the exact identity of the firms in, in the data set. We know whether they are government owned or not. That's the key information that we have in the data set. So one can actually look at that, but there were already too many variables. And also because I wasn't sure that it's that indicator is going to be very significant and very informative. We haven't tried it yet, but but if it's if the question is about identifying firms that are affiliated with, for example, armed forces, etc., et or with government organizations, indirectly, but they are treated as private sector firms. That's not possible, unfortunately, in this data set. Okay, hey, thank you. Let me, okay, double this here. Okay. 
Okay, there's some questions on the Q&A. So, I guess one of them from Dr. Gandhi is actually directed to me. So I'll go ahead and answer that. Is that okay? Yeah, sure. Please. Okay. So yeah, so, I I thought Javad has Javad sorry, his phone he has questions, but okay. please so I wait. Know. I don't know. Javad, I wait until Hadi. Okay, so so the Okay. Hadi, you go ahead. Sure. So Dr. Randy asks, how do you find the change in real wages in your model? Well, in the data set, we have the wage payments and number of workers. So we formed average wage based on industry. So for each industry, we calculated total wage being paid and total employment. So that was average wage for each year. And then we deflate that by CPI. In, sorry, for, for the employment of, in firms be divided by the output price index so that it's a real product wage. Thank you. Okay, I don't have anyone raised hand, but I'm not sure- Can I ask my question now? Okay, please go ahead. Yes, thank you very much. This was really, really good. I learned a lot. And I think the data uh, sources from the surveys and uh, Bijan's amazing insights into uh, uh, Iranian industries uh, for which we don't really have any uh, published data uh, has really give us, given us a lot of things to think about. I have one question and one concern, which is, uh, uh, and I'm asking this from all uh, panelists, uh, if Iran were able to uh, uh, give up uh, its uh, insistence on getting for access to foreign exchange and to oil exports, let's just think about a scenario in which uh, maybe uh, the other oil producers, including Russia, are very concerned about Iran uh, getting into the oil market and Iran says, okay, I don't want to do that. That's fine. You can keep those sanctions on, on oil exports. But in return, I'd like to uh, get uh, the sanctions against financial uh, movements eased so that exporters can, especially small and medium exporters, can better operate in the international market. We know that real wages have dropped significantly in Iran because of real depreciation. So potentially, uh, there is an avenue in which sanctions can improve employment. And I don't see that kind of uh, uh, result yet in the presentations. Uh, does your data and your insights, uh, Bijan, uh, give you uh, information about if Iran was able to get some sanctions relief in terms of access to SWIFT and so on? Would that be able to uh, give us uh, some positive effect on sanctions or positive effect from real depreciation? Thank you. Do you want me to go first, Aida? Uh, you can go ahead and answer, yes. yes. Thank you, Javad. Um, uh, I, I think uh, there is no sort of one answer for all the different sectors in Iran. I think different sectors are developed to different degrees and are also uh, sort of internationally connected to different degrees. Um, for example, uh, one, of the, one of the big advantages of opening up the, the financial sector is that uh, Iran could uh, use the international um, bond markets to to pay for some of its expensive uh, campaigns right now, whether it's the government's uh, economic reform, economic surgery, or or some of the enterprises who have the potential of going international but don't have the the capital to do that. Um, so depending on what sector we are talking about, and depending on whether the government would actually use this reopening of the uh, of the financial channels 
to better finance because it's at the end of the day one of the biggest uh, you know that very well Jawad one of the biggest problems is also the lack of efficiency in the financial sector in Iran I mean uh, and, and that could theoretically be corrected to some degree um, by opening up or lifting some of these uh, financial sanctions so the overall answer is yes but I can also Imagine, and I can, I'm happy to analyze this further, that there are sectors that are more dependent on, on, let's say, some sanctions on commodities being lifted rather than just financial sanctions being lifted. But the, the overall net effect to the economy will definitely be positive. I hope I answered the question. Okay, thank you. Yes, go ahead. I just wanted to add that the results from our estimations show that there is potential for bounce back uh, rather rapidly and production and exports seem to be very responsive to prices. So, so I think if, if Iran has access to markets, it could benefit greatly. However, there's always this problem that Bijan also raised at the end of his presentation that policy making is not really of high quality. Anything else? Anyone has any questions? I want to just add something here. I, I'm sure Bijan agrees with me that even he's discussing because of the sanction, we have seen more innovation in Iran. These entrepreneurs are gonna thrive better, do better if we have an open economy. Basically we have access to outside financially, trade-wise, and also we are competing with everyone. So that way efficiency actually is gonna increase rather than closing the door. And in a closed door, we say, okay, we have to do this and we do that. No, I, I fully agree. I think uh, there was also a question in the question and answer chat. Um, you know, obviously uh, it's, it's much better not to have these limitations and the sanctions and as you say, the, the economic players can definitely benefit from a, from a, a liberated uh, structure. But um, we are in this seminar, we are trying to identify what sanctions have, uh, what kind of an impact sanctions have had. Uh, and, and to underline what I'm trying to argue is that, you know, in a different scenario, a lot of companies could have stopped working because of the situation, because they didn't have access to specific components or to specific technology. But the fact in Iran is that most of them haven't stopped working. They may have tried to find uh, alternatives uh, uh, and uh, you know, alternatives on the international market, but uh, a growing number of these companies have looked inside Iran. And, and we know that uh, the capabilities are there. It's that just they are not, efficiently organized. I mean, the research that's carried out on, at the Iranian universities is sometimes capable of even going international, but because of these past linkages, as I said, it's important to understand that linkages have, have shifted. And I think this is one area of study. I urge some of you who are researching the Iranian economy to, to study the, the, the shifting linkages, because as I said before, it was, Saipa and Iran Khodro were just the licensees of Renault and, and Peugeot and other companies. Today they are developing their own cars and, they are, and they're, this, their suppliers are developing their own components. It's a very different business culture. And I think this is, this is uh, a, a result of sanctions. Obviously it would be a lot more efficient if the economy would open up, I agree. Any else anyone wants to add please Hadi you want to add anything I fully agree with what Bijan says so not much to add I yeah I, I can I agree with what Bijan says but uh, I would say that it would be as Bijan said it would be more efficient if we could have like relationship with the 
let's say foreign firms because of the technology and FDI that, that they can get improved, they can improve their production. But since it's sanctions, so uh, we have to either find an alternative which are not efficient from abroad like other firms in other countries. Let's say that in before the sanctions, uh, Iran Khodro or Cyber they could work with Peugeot but, and French companies, but after the sanction, they had to work with the Chinese companies in order to avoid the sanctions. So in that sense, the efficiency will definitely go down. And also if uh, some of the uh, spare parts in the country, they started to uh, they started to produce the spare part, spare part for the automobile. Again, the efficiency and the quality will go down. So definitely if there's a open relationship and after sanctions, the efficiency and productivity will increase. Yeah, I would like just to add Iranian researchers, Iranian entrepreneurs have done very well outside Iran. Even they didn't have any sanction or any issue. I think when we look at why we used to just imitate or we used to copy, or still we do if there is opportunity, we should look at rules, regulations, accountability, transparency, government regulations, how open the business environment is in Iran. I think there are much more factors to look at it. That's my opinion. And, and good policy making. Yeah, absolutely. But when you when you don't have uh, capable people running the policy making apparatus. And the outcome is not going to be great. Even, even the best recommendations, the best policies, when, when it comes to implementing them, if they're implemented by people who are not confident what they're doing or not knowledgeable enough and not uh, capable of identifying the nuances and details of implementation, things can go wrong very quickly. and we don't get anywhere. And so in, in that sense, responding to the question by Dr. Doraj, who asked whether it would make a difference under JCPOA, renewed JCPOA or current sanctions indefinitely continuing. I think in both situations, I see some growth and growth is gonna be higher under return to JCPOA and more integration in the global economy. But in both cases, we are not going to be seeing a flourishing economy, uh, another North, another South Korea, because the way policy is being implemented and designed is not really that great. And you can't really see the economy take off in, in a, any major way, either way. Thank you very much. Anyone has any questions or closing arguments? So I, I can yes. ask another question. Maybe it's more like a comment. Uh, you know, given that uh, the news about JCPO is not that good, I still think it's a good question to ask whether uh, Iran cutting itself off from uh, its addiction to oil uh, brings benefits. You know, this openness, either you talked about uh, opening up. The problem with opening up is that it brings a lot of oil money. And, you know, some people say we may have as many, Iran may have as many as $100 billion uh, abroad that could become unfrozen. And that changes relative prices inside Iran. This is kind of a uh, openness that uh, economic textbooks don't really discuss, you know, because openness there means uh, productivity increases in export sectors. But here we just have foreign exchange that's coming in. It's going to uh, maybe hurt this uh, industry's manufacturing industry, even the uh, innovation uh, that uh, Bijan was talking about. I wanted to ask your opinion about if there is a middle road, not opening up, 
not having a lot of oil exports and going back to uh, the experience of the two oil booms in 1970s and the 2000s, but one in which uh, this uh, exchange rate is managed in such a way that manufacturing uh, employment can increase. Uh, what, do you, what, would you, what would your uh, recommendation be if uh, uh, JCPOA was revived and Iranian uh, dollars were unfrozen? Uh, wouldn't that hurt manufacturing in the short run, maybe even in the long run? What would you do? What would you recommend the government do uh, to uh, maintain uh, this uh, kind of a positive uh, uh, initial things that you have found out especially in innovations, uh, to continue. Thank you. Uh, my recommendation would be what I actually also mentioned in the presentation. I think what Iran needs is smart investment, not just investment, not just pumping money into the economy, as you say, which will then create uh, new, new challenges and new structural issues. Iran desperately needs uh, uh, smart investments. Uh, I would um, use some of this um, some of this money that would be released uh, to set up some uh, maybe even hard currency funds uh, to help Iranian companies uh, with certain um, you know characteristics or qualities. If it's a company that uh, has been successful in export and needs. Uh, some financial support to expand its export market, so, uh, or or needs uh, some so, some financial injection to be able to create more jobs or or deepen its its innovation or technology. So it, it, the exact opposite of what the Iranian government would do would immediately use this money to fill all the gaps, all the different budget deficit gaps from the past. So as as Hadi was saying, it's a question of governance and and and. Uh, how the, this whole process will be will be managed, but I just wanted to also mention one thing. Uh, even if Iran says um, we are going to stop trying to export more oil and so on, because the uh, and I have learned this from you, Javad, the intuitive uh, notion in the Iranian economy is always to create jobs, always to try to uh, to create jobs, and that's may not be the smartest investment right now because then we would create jobs in in some industries that are a bit obsolete someone had calculated uh, this is a very interesting uh, finding about iran someone had calculated that if you buy the entirety of the production of iran Khodra and saipa and the those are the low low tech iranian cars that are being manufactured and throw all of them into the Persian Gulf, hopefully somewhere else, and then in, import the same quantity of better engine quality cars, whether they are South Korean or, or, or European, that entire investment could be paid by the difference it makes in terms of fuel consumption. This is the type of economy we are trying to deal with. And then the, 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 the policymakers would again use, use that money that would come in to, to invest and create jobs, but those investments and job creations are not necessarily the smartest investments in Iran right now. We need smart investment, and that, um, that I think will make a difference in Iran. And I, would add, and I would just add that we need good policymakers. And also I wanna add, I think what Javad means how to avoid Dutch disease. There are so much research, right. what the, is doing, what Canada is doing. So there are lots of lessons. More money coming in can help. Like to do it. More money coming in can help provide investment resources. And that can be used in a very smart way to help growth go up. But if policymakers are not doing what they need to do, you know, they should be doing, then that's going to go to waste. And whether we, imp we have oil money and we don't have oil money, as, as long as policy is not properly designed and implemented, we, we're not going to get very far. Yeah, I, I just want to add like, regarding the good policy making that uh, was said, it's important to like 
reduce the uncertainty, not just deciding overnight to uh, subsidies or increase the exchange rate or these things. So having like a roadmap for the economy would help and uh, getting like the oil money could actually set the ground for making a better policies, at least in the medium term, not deciding like overnight to do some kind of major policy reforms. Thank you. Anything else? If not, we I would like to conclude the session. Thank you. Thanks to all who attended. And we had very good presentations, good questions and answers. And I wish you all good luck in whatever you're Thank you. Doing. Thank you for chairing the session and uh, thanks to all the participants and good questions and also the great panelists my co-panelists not myself uh, absolutely all of you thank you very much god and vision thank, thank you so much have thank a good day or night wherever you are bye everyone bye. thanks